For division of complex numbers, we'll need the complex conjugate. Suppose we divide x plus yi by a plus bi. Looking at that, it's not clear how to write that as real number plus real number times i. So our trick is going to be multiply by complex conjugate of the denominator over itself. So in this case, we're going to multiply by a minus bi over itself. What's going to happen? In the denominator, we're going to get a squared plus b squared. First, using our trick, that's never going to be equal to zero unless we start with a and b both equal to zero. So I don't have to worry about dividing by zero when we use the trick. Next, a squared plus b squared is a positive real number, so there's no i term there. So when you work out the numerator, that'll have i terms, non-i terms. What we'll be dividing by will be a real number, and we can do that term by term, no problem. So no point memorizing a formula. You'll just use your trick and then follow your nose. So let's try 3 plus 2i over 1 plus i. Complex conjugate of the denominator is 1 minus i. We multiply in the denominator. It's going to give me 1 squared plus 1 squared. Gives me a 2. And then in the numerator, we do our usual complex multiplication, noting that i squared equals minus 1. So what do we get? 3 times this gives me 3 minus 3i. 2i times this term gives me 2i minus 2i squared. Okay, i squared is minus 1, so that turns to a plus 2. So I wind up getting 5 minus i over 2. That 2, I can divide in each term, and that leaves me with 5 halves minus 1 half i. The major operations out of the way, let's do some cleanup. So I want to talk about the real and imaginary parts of z. So the real part is just picking off the x. The imaginary part is just picking off the y. In terms of the complex conjugate, for the real part, I add z to its conjugate. What does that do? Well, we're going to switch the y to a minus y. So the part with the i cancels out, leaving me with twice x. So dividing by 2 gets me back to just x by itself. So that's that formula. For the imaginary part of z, we take the difference. That'll leave us with 2y times i. So I want to divide by 2i to isolate the y. So we get that formula there. Now, with the real and the imaginary parts, okay, to go with this, you'll hear the real and imaginary axes in the complex plane. So here, real axis is what you would think, just the real numbers. So there's no i part to those, okay, no imaginary part. And then you have the imaginary axis, which is just all the multiples of i, okay, real multiples of i. So we'll call real multiples of i also imaginary numbers. So those are going to be the ones where the non-i part is zero. Some afterthoughts on complex conjugation and modulus. So for both of these, we'll be multiplicative. That means it doesn't matter if we do a product, apply our operation, or apply the operations first, and then product. So for example, if I take z times w, take the conjugate, get the same answer as if I took the conjugates and then multiplied. So order doesn't matter. For modulus, if I take the product, take the length, it's going to be the same as if we took the lengths and then multiplied afterwards. Okay, another afterthought on modulus. Also note, okay, we use the same notation as for absolute value of a real number. So that's not a mistake. The idea is, if I take a look at real numbers, what absolute value is telling you is the length from the origin. So if I put a positive number in, the number comes back as is. That's its length from the origin. We put a negative number in, we return the number without the sign, it's a positive number, which is also the length from the origin. So this is consistent with what happens with real numbers. In fact, if you use the definition, when we put a real number in here, it's going to give you the same answer as absolute value. The next big feature of complex numbers, and this is the one that's going to impact ODEs, is going to be Euler's formula. 
So what does this say? This says e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus sine theta times i. We'll give the geometric interpretation of this in a little bit. First, let's show this mechanically. Now, both sides of this equation okay, can be represented by Maclaurin series. Now, for complex numbers, we have no idea whether this actually makes sense or not. I just want you to believe that this could be true. So let's just grind out the Maclaurin series and see mechanically that these wind up being equal. So what's going to happen? I take the Maclaurin series for e to the i theta. So for e to the x, it's going to be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x cubed over 3 factorial. General term is x to the n over n factorial. So I'm going to stick i theta in for x. So we'll write out the first few terms. Now, what's going to happen? We'll have a 1 plus i theta plus i theta squared over 2. i theta squared becomes minus theta squared over 2. I take i theta 3, third power, over 3 factorial. That's going to be theta cubed over 3 factorial. And then I have i cubed, which is minus i. And then for the last term, we're going to have i theta to the fourth over 4 factorial. So it's a theta 4 over 4 factorial, and then I have i to the fourth power. Well, that's i squared times i squared, which is minus 1 times minus 1, which is a 1. For those first five terms, let's collect the terms with an i and without an i. You'll notice for the ones without an i, we get 1 minus theta squared over 2 factorial, plus theta to the 4 over 4 factorial, and you see that the Maclaurin series for cosine is starting to develop. Okay, and it actually will give us the Maclaurin series for cosine. We take it all the way out. For the terms with an i in them, we're going to get theta minus theta cubed over 3 factorial. And then you'll see the Maclaurin series for sine develop. So we're going to have that times an i. So what are we going to get? It's going to be cosine theta plus sine theta times i. If we put pi into the Euler formula, what comes out? Well, e to the i pi equals cosine pi, which is minus 1, plus sine pi i, sine of pi is 0. So we get a minus 1 out. If I push the minus 1 to the other side, we get e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. So this is called Euler's identity. and gets people excited because it has five big math numbers in it. 0, 1, e, i, and pi. We'll have a perfectly good geometric interpretation in a second. Back to Euler's formula, we want to see what e to the i theta equal to cosine theta plus sine theta means in terms of geometry. So note, if I take e to the i theta, put it back into rectangular coordinates, we're going to have the point cosine theta, sine theta. Okay, now that should ring some bells. If you notice, cosine theta is the x value on the unit circle, sine theta is the y value in the unit circle. So this is telling us exactly that e to the i theta is going to be given by, you start at 0 on the unit circle, and then just move by theta. That'll take you to cosine theta, sine theta. So that's how we interpret e to the i theta. It's just our point in the unit circle going clockwise from 0 to theta. Now, let's recheck the modulus. So I want to take our modulus of e to the i theta. How do I do that? We take x and y, square them, add them, take the square root. So I'm going to take cosine squared plus sine squared gives me a 1. Square root of 1 is 1. So we know if we think of this as the length from 0, okay, if the length from 0 is going to be 1, then this is definitely on the unit circle. Okay, let's do a little bit of interpretation here. How about if I look at e to the i pi? So we know that's going to be minus 1 from Euler's identity. OK, well, our angle here is going to be pi. So I start at 0, go counterclockwise by pi, and where do I wind up? OK, we're back on the real line, but facing in the other direction, we're on minus 1. So that's how you interpret the Euler identity geometrically. Now, how about i squared equal to minus 1? So first, let's figure out what i is in terms of our Euler formula. Okay, well, 
i is equal to 0 plus 1 times i, so it's going to be the point 0 comma 1. That's up here at pi halves. So that means e to the pi halves i is equal to i, which feels weird because you have an i in the exponent and you have an i down on the ground level. Okay, but makes perfect sense. Now, if I take e to the pi halves i times e to the pi halves i, okay, well, we have the same base, so we add the angles. That gives me pi i. So i squared is equal to e to the pi i, and we know that's minus 1. So that just reconfirms i squared equals minus 1. Another consequence of the Euler formula, some angle identities for trig functions. So we take a look. If I take two points on the unit circle, okay, we can represent them by their angles. So that would be e to the i theta 1, e to the i theta 2. Since that numbers here have the same base, when I multiply, we just add the angles. So that's a geometric interpretation of multiplication for points in the unit circle. Figure out both their angles. When you multiply, the new point is just the sum of the angles. Okay, now, we could actually pull this apart in terms of cosine and sine. And what will happen is, when you group the non-i stuff together, we're going to have cosine theta 1 plus theta 2, and then you'll have a familiar identity on the other side. If you do it for the i terms, you'll get the identity for sine of theta 1 plus theta 2.